Lesson 10 for May 30 to June 5, The Bible as History, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 30. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word because that's what we're here for, to learn what your word says and to also have your word speak to us about who you are. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. We're going to be looking at how the Bible interrelates with history. And we pray that as we do so, that our minds may be open and your spirit may be so influential in our lives that we may be able to show others what it's like to have Jesus as our Saviour and you as our God. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2. It's also the same as Deuteronomy 5 verse 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Let's read that again. Exodus 20 verse 2 or Deuteronomy 5 verse 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Bible is constituted in history. Biblical history moves in a linear direction from an absolute beginning, when God created all things, to the ultimate goal, when he will restore the earth at his second coming. The historical nature of scripture is one characteristic that distinguishes it from the sacred books of other religions. The Bible assumes the existence of a God who personally acts in history. It does not try to prove that existence. In the beginning, God speaks, and life on earth is created, as we read right through Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 31. He calls Abram out of the Chaldees. He delivers his people from the bondage of Egypt. He writes the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone with his own finger, as we find in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. He sends prophets. He sends judgments. He calls people to live and share his divine law and the plan of salvation with other nations. Ultimately, he sends his son Jesus Christ into the world, thus dividing history forever. This week, we'll look at some of the key issues in history as portrayed in the Bible and at some of the archaeological evidence that helps substantiate history as expressed in the Bible. Sunday, May 31, David, Solomon and the Monarchy The monarchy of David and Solomon represents the golden age in Israel's history. But what if David and Solomon did not exist, as some have claimed? What if their kingdom was not as extensive as the Bible describes, as some have also claimed? Without David, there would be no Jerusalem, the capital of the nation. Let's read Second Samuel chapter 5, verses 6 to 10. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking, David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Now David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David, and David built all around from the Milo and inward. So David went on and became great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. Without David, there would be no temple built by his son Solomon. We read about that 
construction in First Kings chapter 8, verses 17 to 20. Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, Whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son, who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke, and I have, full, I have filled the position of my father David, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and I have built a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Finally, without David there would be no future Messiah, for it is through the line of David that a Messiah is promised in Jeremiah 23 verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper, and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our Righteousness. And Revelation 22, verse 16, I, Jesus, have set my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Israelite history would need to be completely rewritten. Yet that history, as it reads in Scripture, is precisely what gives Israel and the church its unique role and mission. Question, read First Samuel chapter 17. How does God provide a decisive victory for Israel? Who is used for this victory? Where does the victory take place? First Samuel chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sukkah, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Sukkah and Azekah and in Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armour on his legs, and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed six hundred shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel, and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. 
So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then, as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming out from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and... When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armour and put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armour and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog, that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." Then all this assembly shall know 
that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it, and struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Shariam, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armour in his tent. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. Then, as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Notice the precise geographical description of the battle lines in 1 Samuel 17, 1-3. The site of Kerbet Koyapha is located on the hills exactly in the area of the Israelite camp described in this chapter. Recent excavations there revealed a massively fortified garrison city from the time of Saul and David overlooking the valley. Two contemporaneous gates were excavated. Since most cities in ancient Israel had only one gate, this characteristic may help identify the site of Sharaim from 1 Samuel 17.52, which in Hebrew means two gates. If this is the case, then we have identified for the first time this ancient biblical city. In 2008 and 2013, two inscriptions were found that many believe represent the oldest Hebrew writing ever discovered. The second inscription mentions the name of Eshbal, the same name as one of Saul's sons in 1 Chronicles 9.39. In 1993, excavations at the northern city of Tel Dan uncovered a monumental inscription written by King Hazael of Damascus, who records his victory over the king of Israel and the king of the house of David. This is the same way the dynasty of David is described in the Bible, adding more powerful archaeological evidence that David existed in history, just as the Bible says. So, to finish today, think through the implications of what it would mean for our faith if, as some people claim, King David did not really exist. Monday, June 1, Isaiah, Hezekiah, and Sennacherib. Question. Read Isaiah chapter 36, verses 1 to 3, and Isaiah 37, verses 14 to 27. In this account of a massive Assyrian campaign against Judah, how does God deliver his people? Isaiah 36, beginning at verse 1, Now it came to pass in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, 
And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asap the recorder, came out to him. And Isaiah 37, verses 14 to 38. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers, and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord, and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high? Against the Holy One of Israel? By your servants you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter its farthest height, to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk water, and with the soles of my feet I have dried up all the brooks of defence. Did you not hear long ago how I made it? from ancient times that I formed it. Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into heaps and ruins, therefore their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and grain blighted before it is grown. But I know your dwelling place, your going out and your coming in, and your rage against me. Because your rage against me and your tumult have come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you came. This shall be a sign to you. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself, and the second year what springs from the same. Also in the third year sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant, who have escaped of the house of Judah, shall again take root downward, and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, will do this. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor build a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000, and when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass, as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that his sons Adramelech and Sherezer struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Eershadon, his son, reigned in his place. In 701 BC, Sennacherib campaigns against Judah. The account is recorded in Scripture. It also is recorded by Sennacherib himself in several ways. In his historical annals, discovered in the capital city of Nineveh, he boasts, 
46 of his, that's Hezekiah's, strong walled towns and innumerable small villages in their neighbourhood I besieged and conquered. In Sennacherib's palace at Nineveh, he celebrates his defeat of the Judean city of Lachish by covering the walls of a central room of the palace with relief depictions of his siege and battle against the city. Recent excavations at Lachish have uncovered the massive destruction debris of the city after it was burned by Sennacherib. But Jerusalem is miraculously spared. Sennacherib is able to boast only this, As for Hezekiah the Judean, I shut him in his city like a bird in a cage. There is no description of destroying Jerusalem, and no account of captives being taken into slavery. It is true that Jerusalem was besieged, but the Bible records that the siege lasted for one day only, as the angel of the Lord delivers Jerusalem, as Isaiah had predicted in Isaiah thirty-seven thirty-three to 35 Therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come into this city, says the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake, and for the sake of my servant David. Interestingly, only Lachish is prominently depicted in Nineveh, the Assyrian capital. Jerusalem is not found on the palace walls. Sennacherib could boast only of his defeat of Lachish. The showdown between the God of heaven and the gods of the Assyrians is demonstrated in the deliverance of his people. He sees the acts of aggression by Assyria. He hears the words of Hezekiah's prayer. God acts in history. So to finish the day, how can you remember that the God who so miraculously delivered Israel at this time and place is the same God whom you pray to, rely on, and trust in today. Tuesday, June 4, Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon In July 2007, a scholar from the University of Vienna was working on a project in the British Museum when he found a tablet from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. On the tablet, he found the name Nebuchadnezzar, the name of a Babylonian official mentioned in Jeremiah 39, verse 3. Nebuchadnezzar is one of many individuals both kings and officials who, thanks to archaeology, have been rediscovered from the time of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Question, read Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 5. How do the early decisions of Daniel correspond to the acts of God in using him as his servant and prophet to impact millions of people throughout the world. Daniel 1, beginning at verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. 
But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favour and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs, and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And, as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter, and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink, and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days... When the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. And Daniel chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosened, and his knees knocked against each other. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live for ever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God, and in the days of your father light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, and interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belt to Shazza, now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. 
Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not give the interpretation of the thing, and I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king, and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom, and majesty, glory, and honour. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all people's nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men, and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven." They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines, have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified him. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, Mini, Mini, Tekel, Euphasim. This is the interpretation of each word. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about sixty-two years old. Daniel purposed in his heart, we read in Daniel 1.8, to remain faithful to God in regard to what he both ate and prayed. These good habits, formed early in his experience, became the pattern that would give him strength for his long life. The result was clear thinking, wisdom and understanding that came from on high. This was recognised by Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, so that he was elevated to the highest positions in the kingdom. But perhaps more important, it resulted in the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar himself, which we read about in Daniel 4, verses 34 to 37. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honoured him who lives for ever." For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth no one can restrain his hand, or say to him, What have you done? At the same time my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom my honour and splendour returned to me. My counsellors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was given to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. Nebuchadnezzar was the son of Nabopolassar. Together they built up a glorious city 
unsurpassed in the ancient world, as we read in Daniel 4.30. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honour of my majesty? The city of Babylon was enormous, with more than 300 temples, an exquisite palace, and surrounded by huge walls, 12 and 22 foot thick. The walls were punctuated by eight major gates, all named after the major Babylonian deities. The most famous is the Ishtar Gate, excavated by the Germans and reconstructed in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. In Daniel 7 verse 4, Babylon is described as a lion with eagle wings. The first was like a lion and had eagle wings, and I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. The processional way leading up to the Ishtar gate is lined with images of 120 lions. An image of a huge lion pouncing on a man also was found during excavations and still stands today outside the city. These all testify to the lion as an appropriate symbol for Babylon the Great. Biblical history and its prophetic message are confirmed. And so to finish today, Daniel 1.8 said that Daniel purposed in his heart. What does that mean? What are some things that you need to purpose in your heart about doing or not doing? Wednesday, June 3, The Historical Jesus Question, read Matthew 26, 57-67, John eleven forty five to 53 and John eighteen twenty nine to 31 Who was Caiaphas, and what was his role in the death of Christ? Who was Pontius Pilate, and how was his decision most important for the Sanhedrin to accomplish its goals? First of all, Matthew 26, beginning at verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, Now you have heard his blasphemy, what do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands. And John 11, beginning at verse 45, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish? Now, this he did not say on his own authority, but 
Being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then, from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. And John 18, beginning at verse 29, Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If it were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Caiaphas was high priest and instigated the plot to seek the death of Jesus. His existence also is recorded by Josephus, the Jewish historian, writing in behalf of the Romans. In uh, Josephus' Uh, complete works, uh, published in 1969, Book 18, Chapter 4, page 381, we read, Besides which he also deprived Joseph, who was also called Caiaphas, of the high priesthood, and appointed Jonathan, the son of Ananus, the former high priest, to succeed him. End of quote. In 1990, a family tomb was discovered south of Jerusalem containing twelve osheries, or bone boxes. The coins and pottery from the tomb dated to around the middle of the first century AD. The most ornate of the osheries, with multiple sets of bones in it, contains the name Joseph, son of Caiaphas. Many scholars believe this to have been the tomb and bone box of Caiaphas, the high priest so directly involved in the death of Jesus. In 1961, an inscription bearing the name of Pontius Pilate, the prefect of Judea under Emperor Tiberius, was found on a stone in the theatre at Caesarea Maritima. Thus, in both of these cases, some of the principal figures surrounding the death of Christ have been corroborated by history. Secular historians of the first two centuries also speak of Jesus of Nazareth. Tacitus, the Roman historian, writes of Christ, his execution by Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius, and early Christians in Rome. Pliny the Younger, a Roman governor, writes in AD 112 to 113 to the Emperor Trajan asking how he should treat the Christians. He describes them as meeting on a certain day before light where they gather and sing hymns as to a god. These archaeological discoveries and historical sources provide an extra non-biblical framework for the existence of Jesus, who was worshipped within the first 50 years after his death. The Gospels themselves are the primary sources about Jesus, and we should study them carefully to learn more about Jesus and his life. So, to finish today, though it's always nice to have archaeological evidence that supports our faith, Why must we learn not to make our faith depend upon these things as helpful as they might at times be? Thursday, June 4. Faith and History We don't live in vacuums. Our choices influence not just ourselves, but others as well. In the same way, the lives of many of God's ancient people have had a great impact on the future of others besides themselves. In Hebrews chapter 11, that well-known faith chapter, we see in summary the influence of many of these ancient heroes of faith. Question. Read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 40. What lessons can we learn from these ancient heroes and by studying their lives? And I'll just list them. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Rahab and Samson. Let's begin. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. 
by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God." By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore." These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward." By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again." 
Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Faith is not simply a belief in something or someone. It is acting in response to that belief. It is a faith that works. This is what is reckoned as righteousness. It is those faith actions that change history. Each of these actions depends on a reliance on God's word. Noah acted in faith when he built the ark, trusting in the word of God over experience and reason. Because it had never rained, experience and reason suggested that a flood made absolutely no sense. But Noah obeyed God and the human race survived. Abraham, then called Abram, left Ur in southern Mesopotamia, the most sophisticated city in the world at that time, and went out, not knowing where God would lead him. But he chose to act on God's word. Moses chose to become a shepherd leading God's people to the promised land rather than to become the king over Egypt, the great empire of his day. He trusted in the Almighty's voice, calling out from the burning bush. Rahab decided to trust the report of God's deliverance, protected the two spies, and became part of the lineage of Jesus. How little we know about how our decisions will affect the lives of countless people in this generation and those to come. And so to finish today, what crucial decisions are impending before you? How do you make the choices that you do and why? Friday, June 5. The Bible is the most ancient and the most comprehensive history that men possess. It came fresh from the fountain of eternal truth, and throughout the ages a divine hand has preserved its purity. It lights up the far distant past where human research in vain seeks to penetrate. In God's word only do we behold the power that laid the foundations of the earth and that stretched out the heavens. Here only do we find an authentic account of the origin of nations. Here only is given a history of our race unsullied by human pride or prejudice. And from Testimonies for the Church, volume 8, page 325, He who has a knowledge of God and his word has a settled faith in the divinity of the Holy Scriptures. He does not test the Bible by man's ideas of science. He brings these ideas to the test of the unerring standard. He knows that God's word is truth, and truth can never contradict itself. Whatever in the teaching of so-called science contradicts the truth of God's revelation is mere human guesswork. To the really wise, scientific research opens vast fields of thought and information. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, flesh out the question asked at the end of Wednesday's study. Yes, it's good when we find archaeological evidence that confirms biblical history. But what happens when archaeological evidence is found that is interpreted in ways that contradict the biblical story? What should this tell us about the fact that we must depend on the Word of God as the Word of God and trust it as such, regardless of the claims of archaeology or any other human science? 2. Think about all the biblical prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past that, from today's vantage point, we can see as having been fulfilled. Think, for example, of most of the kingdoms of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7. 
How can we learn from these prophecies which have been fulfilled in history and to trust the Lord about the prophecies that are yet for the future? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled From Armenia to Cyprus and it's written by Ermine Orfanidi. I was born in Armenia to a Greek father and an Armenian mother. From childhood I believed in God and wanted to own a Bible. But at the time Bibles were hard to find and very expensive in Armenia. One day, a Seventh-day Adventist neighbour invited me to a series of meetings. Those who attended faithfully would receive a free Bible. I jumped at the idea of finally owning a Bible. Death always bothered me. It seemed like such a meaningless end to life. Then the preacher spoke about the resurrection at Jesus' second coming. It was amazing. I can still vividly remember the picture that he showed of resurrected people coming out of their graves. When a call was made for baptism, I was the first to respond. Something happened. Before baptism, I tried to read the Bible a few times, but I couldn't understand it. I wondered how others could spend hours reading it. After baptism, everything began to make sense. I consider this to be one of the many miracles that God has performed in my life. Four months after my baptism, I moved to Cyprus. Though part Greek, I did not speak Greek and felt like a stranger in a strange land. For 16 years, I didn't know about the Adventist church in Cyprus. Many trials came my way, but God stood by me. Then, through a friend, I located the church. Apprehension filled me on my first visit. How would the church members relate to me? All apprehension vanished as the members enveloped me with love. To this day, my church is my family, my second home. Since that first visit five years ago, I have hardly missed a Sabbath. Now I am fluent in Greek, I enjoy teaching adult and teen Sabbath school classes. Even more remarkable, my mother, sister-in-law and two nieces also attend church with me. The love of the members won them over. I am waiting and praying for the day soon when my son will also take his stand for Jesus. There's a picture here of this young lady. I thank God for his goodness and look forward to a happy life with him here and for eternity. Part of the 13th Sabbath offering this quarter will help construct a new church building and community centre in Nicosia, Cyprus. Thank you for helping to spread the gospel around the world. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.